especially the first offer was a bit easier because uh, at the time I was you know still growing on Twitch. The second offer was a lot harder a because the sum of money was absolutely ridiculous. It's just it's money I would never even dream to make, let alone to refuse. So that it's just it's just not something that you ever can plan for at in my opinion at a young age. Probably the heaviest topic so far. Uh, I think it's something I always struggle with was uh, not controlling. The other day, I was watching your interview with Juan Franco, which uh, mm. I'll be linking in the description box down below. And when he asked you about the clans or teams you'd played for in the past, I was very mm. happy and very proud to hear that the first name you dropped was the Jedi clan, <laughs> <laughs> which tells me that despite all the success and all the fame you've now attained, you still haven't forgotten where you came from and you haven't forgotten your roots in Age of yeah. Empires. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah. And you know, I was happy and proud because of the time I was sort of a team captain for the Jedi clan. Mm -hmm. And I remember all too well when you joined us. When must this have been, Hera? 2013, maybe? 2014? 2013, I believe. Late 2013 or early 2014. Could have also spanned both. Um, okay. Yeah, that's definitely the, the years. Yeah, back then you went by the very prophetic name Pro at AOE. I, I remember it all too well, my friend. Like, it, it, the crazy part is I thought that that was cool, by the way. Like I... I didn't make that username as a joke. I thought that was cool. I was like, yeah. Yeah, I want to be a pro at this game. And that's my username. And I thought I was really good because I beat the AI on, hard, on hardest. You know, the standards for a cool were very different back then. You, you know how I capitalized my nickname as well? Yeah. Mojmova. I thought that was cool. And it was actually cool back then. And yeah, you know, yeah. people, <laughs> people used to make fun of us for being a noob clan back then. But I think history has kind of vindicated us, you know? I mean, yeah. you started in the Jedi clan. Barl started in the Jedi clan. <laughs> I, th I think Ganji started in the Jedi clan as well. So many good players. You can't be all just a coincidence, you know? <laughs> all right, Hera, listen up, man. You just yeah. came back from, uh, from Germany a few days ago after winning the last S tier tournament of 2022, that mm -hmm. grand melee. And I obviously want to hear your thoughts and feelings about the whole event. But since it's the first time you're here on the show, uh, I first want to go back in time to when you first played the game. You have three brothers, two older and one younger. Mm -hmm. They were playing the game. You saw them playing and then you started playing it too, right? Yeah. This must have been around 2012, 2013. So there were four boys in the household. Huge respect to Mr. and Mrs. Hera. I can only imagine the kind of mischief you guys got into. I mean, I have two kids. I can't imagine how hard it must be with four. Uh, do your brothers follow your career? Do they watch your tournament games? Uh, yeah, they actually do. So the the funny thing is that growing up, we actually we actually had very similar um, like very similar hobbies, very similar interests. So it wasn't just like brothers. We were actually like more like just like friends as well. Like we just play mm -hmm. the same games. We would like watch the same shows, that kind of stuff. So like we weren't always hanging out together, but we had a lot of like, uh, you know, a, a good bond, especially over video games. So mm -hmm. uh, and th as we grew older, that didn't really change. So they definitely still keep up. I definitely tell my family after every tournament win, after every tournament loss, even what happened, how I feel, how it went, etc. And uh, yeah, they Amazing. they definitely picked up a few things. They actually know some of the other top players as well. So. I wouldn't say that they know a lot about the scene, but they know a good amount. Like they, they definitely follow quite a bit, which is awesome. Do they say play? Um, actually, my brother got it, like one of my older brothers and my younger brother got it on the, like a PC in the house, mm -hmm. and they played from time to time. But it's very, very like casual campaign, w w once in a while kind of stuff. That's cool, yeah. though. That's cool. What about your parents? Do they watch your games? Um, yeah, they follow my tournaments. They Amazing, watch man. sometimes, and yeah, they they are quite supportive now, which is awesome as well. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. do they watch the whole Grand Melee thing? I'm actually not sure if they watch the Grand Melee. Like, I know for NEC three, for example, like now we're winding a couple years. I know mm -hmm. my dad watched like a really good amount, even not even my games, even you know uh, games of other people. Uh, so he was really following that one. I think the Grand Melee because it was on like a different channel, they didn't really watch, but they just mm -hmm. followed. Uh, Red Bull they watched so yeah they, they watch from time to time and they follow pretty much all the time I wonder how someone from the outside kind of feels like watching these kinds of shows do they enjoy it because I mean of course I enjoy it I love Age of Empires but mm -hmm. I wonder if someone is only mildly interested in esports do, do you think that they like the kind of show I mean it's just a good show or is it only a good show for those of us who actually like to watch Age of Empires too that's a great question I think that goes like beyond just me and my fam but what I can speak about that a little bit is like I feel like 
we're in a position now we have great casters we have great players and we have great production and the mm-hmm. game is in a good spot so it's right. all of those kind of coincided to make these shows pretty much excellent so i think with the high production value and you know solid um, you know people up there we actually produce a good show for even the people that don't understand age of empires so i would say that now like now and going forward i think the game will continue to attract you know a small percentage of completely new viewers every time we have a big tournament just because of how easy it is to watch and follow along right right i agree so much with that because apart from being an obviously very good game i think it's a nice game to watch mm-hmm. i think it's just fun you know you see an archer you know what an, what an archer does right it shoots from range you see mm-hmm. a, a knight you know it runs fast you see yeah. a swordsman you know it has a sword it fights melee so i think it's a very easy on the eyes and it's easy not easy to understand but kind of easy to follow along you know uh, yeah. a few years ago i think it was the semi-final king of the desert three this was leary versus yo there was this amazing moment on stream uh this was mem a mem tournament so that means players had to have their webcams on while playing and so after leary beat yo in an incredibly close series you can actually see Leary's father storming his room and rushing to hug him. It was such a wholesome moment. So I'm wondering if something like that happened with you and their brothers when you won, <laughs> uh, let's say, Hidden Cup 4, for example? Uh, actually, no, because uh, they never rushed into the room because they like they weren't watching like uh, live at the time. And also, like I jumped right. into an interview. So there was never a moment like that. But what would happen right. is I'd leave and we'd like celebrate. They'll be like, yo, congratulations, good job, etc. They were actually having, like in Hidden Cup, they were playing the games on the TV outside the room. So they mm-hmm. were definitely keeping up. And yeah, it was uh, it was something similar, but not quite as as wholesome as that Leary moment with his father. Oh, it's still amazing that yeah. your family supports you. For yeah, and sure. I was wondering, how does your family and your parents specifically feel about your career as a streamer and a professional gamer? Do mm-hmm. they see it as something completely normal or do you feel like they're still a little bit skeptical about the whole thing? Uh, at first, so the, the funny thing is at first, uh, they thought I was just playing games and wasting my time. And to a certain extent, they were actually right because okay. for the most part of the, my career, I would say like, it was a lot about just playing. I wasn't making money. I wasn't making content. I wasn't doing something productive. I'm just playing a game by myself pretty much. And yeah, for the most, most part of like the years growing up, it was just a hobby or a time waster. And so the problem is from their perspective, it was completely like worthless or mm-hmm. useless as far as like an eight hours a day kind of thing. You know, a few hours a day, leisure is fine. But when I'm playing that much, um, it's definitely just not something they can approve of. And mm-hmm. that's not only that, I was, I was also playing League of Legends, like other games for long hours a day. So I've pretty much always been a gamer and I didn't start playing AOE to, to make it a job. So right. at first they weren't uh, supportive of it and for good reason. Like I don't blame them for that at all. I think they started to become a little bit more supportive around NEC. Uh, a little bit of backstory there. I asked them to go once. They said no initially because my university was starting on that same time. And then I, I asked them again like a couple of weeks later. I actually told Nilly I'm not going. Then I, I, I asked. Well, yeah, was it NEC 2? Wasn't it NEC 2? NEC 3, NEC three right after three. DE came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I asked them again afterwards, you know, please let me go. Like, this is a big event. Um, and then they said, you know what? Sure. I told them the prize pool. I told them why it's a big event. And they said, you know what? Sure. Um, so I took time off university, like at the start, start of the semester. Right. So it was a really dicey moment. But it's, I think NEC, it was worth it because NEC was such a big moment for my AOE like, career, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. I hate calling it a career because it's like just gaming. No, it is, day. but it is. It's but, a career. Yeah. <laughs> it's your job. It's your job. Yeah. And you made it to the final, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, I made it to the final and that was completely unexpected. Like I had zero expectations. Barely anyone knew me then. It, the only reason I had a following is because after DE came out, I was spamming games on 1v1. So a lot of the new guys came to watch my channel, but no one really knew who I was or anything like that. Um, and so that was definitely a big moment. And it was the first moment I felt like where my parents can actually see that it's something real. There's a lot of right. viewers, tournament, like a, a lot of players there competing. Production was great. And it was like, you know, decent money as far as price will go. So they can see it as something real from there. Amazing. So from that moment on, things kind of shifted and they kind of saw it as something a little bit more serious and something you can kind of dedicate your life to. Yeah. And it also took a lot of explaining from my end to kind of talk them through what streaming is and why I can justify right. spending hours a day doing that. Yeah. yeah. You know, despite how much more popular the world of esports has become in the last couple of, a couple of years, I feel like there's still a fair amount of skepticism uh, towards mm-hmm. it. And we're nowhere near being as widely accepted as regular sports, right? Why do you think that's the case? Is it just because it's something very new? 
Um, I think it being new is one thing, but I also think that the gaming lifestyle itself is not seen as something respectable because at least may maybe the perception has changed. But I feel like back in the day, the people who were gaming were the guys that, you know, no life, just spending all day by themselves, no friends. They don't go outside. They stay at their house and play video games. Right. And that was kind of like the misconception back then because I don't think that was ever true. I think that was just a stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's just not a respectable, like, position to, to be in. And I feel like maybe that carried on a bit. But in recent years, gaming has become a lot more mainstream. People have seen that it's more of like a thing that you do with friends as well, not just by yourself. It doesn't right. have to go to an extreme, etc. So I think that it, it's definitely getting a better reputation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the pandemic played a role there too, right? Because a lot ah, more yeah. people uh, sat at home and started watching stuff at their computer, right? Definitely. Okay, so you picked up the game from your brothers, and then in 2013, you start playing online after you discover Zero Empires on YouTube. And to the people listening to this, if the name Zero Empires doesn't mean anything to you, make sure to check episode 7 of this podcast. It was a hugely important figure uh, for Age of Empires too. Now, you talked about this uh, just now and in another interview, but when you started playing online, at first, you had a bit of reality check, right? You realized pretty <laughs> early on that beating the hardest AI does not, in fact, make you a pro at AOE. And there are tons and tons of people playing this game who happen to be incredibly good at it. So mm -hmm. from that moment on, is becoming a very high-rated player a goal you immediately set for yourself, or does it just kind of happen naturally as you're playing the game more and more? Yeah, that, that's a really crazy thing to talk about now as well. Because uh, when I <laughs> when I when I wanted to start playing, we already spoke about it. But I I wanted to be good, and I thought I was already good. Um, but when the reality check came in, it was kind of like, oh, okay, like this is harder than I thought. But because I'm super competitive and because I really enjoyed the game, I still made it a goal to get to a pro level. But the funny <laughs> thing is, back then it wasn't about making money. It wasn't about winning tournaments. It was just about right. getting to high high spot on the ladder. There were That's no tournaments. Was. There were yeah, there was no it, money to be made. Exactly. From like the the top tournaments back then were like a hundred dollars prize pool. The show matches were like ten dollar prize pool for like five best of fives and stuff like that. Maybe maybe fifty dollars if you're lucky. And so like there was very little money to be made, and it was just about getting to the top of the ladder because I enjoyed it and because I found it really fun. Right, right. So it, you just immediately wanted to be a good player, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of amazing. So is it safe to assume you're a very competitive guy? <laughs> yes, and I think sometimes too much. Um, but okay. I, I, I do think that I needed that hyper competitiveness to get to where I am right now. You know, I remember you being one of those guys that improved ridiculously fast. Uh, I think just a few months after joining the Jedi clan, you were already much higher rated than me. And by the time I had been playing the game for years, no, I'm kind of a lost cause, so I'm not sure how much that actually means. But anyway, this kind of explosion and improvement would seem to indicate you have a very high degree of natural talent for the game. However, in one of the interviews we recorded together for Warlords, you said you don't think you're talented at all, and you attribute your success in the game mainly to the fact you're an incredibly hardworking guy, which we all know you are. Uh, but do you truly believe you have no talent for the game whatsoever, or were you just being hyperbolic for a dramatic effect? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I genuinely believe that. Now, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that, so maybe I can explain a little bit more. Please. Um, I had never played any computer games before AOE. I never played any RTS. It was a completely brand new thing to the table. So when I say I'm not talented, it's because I didn't come from any background to where I'm actually just good at that. And I don't think that naturally I had anything in my life that suggests that I'm going to be good at a video game. The only thing I had was that I'm good at games. I played a lot of games before that, some Call of Duty, some FIFA, mm -hmm. you know, w whatever it might be. So I'm just good at games. But I don't think that that translates as well to AOE as, as it should. And I think that something that kind of proves that I wasn't naturally talented is because when I started, I dropped to like 1400 ELO with the starting at 1600. So in today's standards, I, I was like a 900 or even an 850 ELO player. Um, and I don't think that someone who's naturally talented drops like to that level. I think they just go up like rather quickly. And mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I don't feel like I, I came in at a higher level. I just feel like I came in with a, a really good mindset. And then that's something that even when I'm coaching to this day, I don't care what kind of natural talent they come in with. It's all about them wanting to improve and knowing the steps of how to improve. I think that's way more important than natural talent. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very interesting what you say there. Uh, in my daily job, I work very often with extremely talented kids, and I've come to realize that talent comes in many different shapes and forms. And mm -hmm. I think, wouldn't you agree that you having this capacity to work incredibly hard on your game, having this capacity to grind hours on end, day after day, even when you're probably not feeling like it, like doing it at all, 
isn't that in and of itself a form of talent? Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, honestly, because yeah, you may not be right many about people. That. Not many people have that. Yeah. Uh, you may be right. Maybe it's just my <clears throat> misunderstanding of the word talent. I always think of talent as someone who's just like insanely good at something for no reason. Uh, and like I'm way too focused on like the mechanical aspect, but maybe the mindset definitely has a role. So then maybe I would re like rephrase my statement and say that my talent came from the mindset and the mentals and not uh, not so much the like on hand experience, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people love to exaggerate what it means to have talent and mm -hmm. nobody really knows what it is, right? Being talented. So y you wouldn't count being talented as one of the most important aspects in getting good at the game, for example. Yeah, I just maybe, I don't know, I feel like talent is just used as like, kind of like a buzzword, like, oh, this guy's talented, like, he's just natural, like, it's, uh, you know, it's, he's like a phenomenon, like, watch out for this guy. But I, I feel like if we're talking about talent, then I achieve something that no one else can achieve, or like something like that, you know, but I don't mm -hmm. think that what I did, no one else can achieve. In fact, a few people have achieved it, both my rapid uh, improvement at a young age, and also like my ceiling now, not like I'm playing at a level that no one else can match. No, nor did I improve at a level that no one else can match. People have done it. I'm not anyone special, maybe just like top five or top 10 in terms of how fast I rose to the, to the top ratings. So I don't think that really, like for that reason, I don't feel like it's talent and something that someone else can't achieve or anything like that. I just feel like if someone comes in with a similar mindset and the will to improve, they can achieve the same thing I did. It's nothing that special, I would say. I'll, <laughs> I'll be incredibly skeptical about that because you're still talking about the top five from a pool of, I don't know, like 200,000 players. I think that's the regular number of people who got playing the game. Uh, so I think you need to have something very special <laughs> to get to the level that you've got. Maybe. All right. Maybe. Yeah, I, I'm pre pretty sure about that. <laughs> okay. Listen, man, uh, as I said before, you started playing online. Um, mm -hmm. After you started playing online, you became a good player incredibly fast, but you didn't mm -hmm. make it to the top three or top five right away. No. Uh, that only happened much later. I want to say your journey to becoming a top player started roughly around 2019 when you became a lot more active as a streamer, right? Yeah. And, and that's when things really start taking off for you. Your stream becomes a huge success. Your channel grows really fast, uh, especially after the release of DE later that year. Um, you make huge improvements as a player and the tournament successes start coming one after the other. In July 2019, you get third, fourth prize in the Mangrove Shallows Cup. Then in 2020, you finished second in NEC 3, just talked about it. Second in Hidden Cup 3, third, fourth, Red Bull Wallala 1, second, Red Bull Wallala 2. And then finally, in early 2021, the long-awaited S-tier tournament victory arrived in Hidden Cup 4, where you had to beat Tato, Leary, Viper, and then Jordan in the final. And this is the tournament that really cements your position as an undisputed top three player in the world. Would you say that was, to this day, still your best victory or the victory that felt the most beautiful and the most amazing to you? Uh, it's between Hidden Cup uh, 4 and the tournament that just came to pass, the Grand Melee. I have mixed opinions. I'm actually not sure what is the better moment overall, but I do think that Hidden Cup was the bigger tournament because uh, the, it was like the fourth of its you know, edition, a lot more viewership towards it, uh, a lot more hype behind it. And for that reason, the win was just like like incredible. Like the, the hype that you know came with it, uh, the feeling of finally winning the first S tier. There was just a lot of things that made that moment really special to me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that overall, that would be like the best moment of my career. Mm -hmm. But I do think that um, the Grand Mule is maybe a very close second just because the land events and the atmosphere there is something else. And obviously the prize pool is much bigger. And I will say the games and the quality of gameplay in the Grand Mule were some of the best AW we've ever seen. Maybe even the best AW we've ever seen. Like it was really pretty amazing level. pretty yeah. amazing for sure we'll be talking about it some uh, a little bit later um as someone who loves coaching you obviously think very deeply about this game so <laughs> are you aware of some very specific changes you made to your game during those years that you were getting better that really allowed you to hit the next level i mean was there something that you're now looking back you can really tell yeah so that thing that change had a huge impact in how i play um I think there's a couple moments <clears throat> where I made some big changes that really changed how I play. I think the first one was we're removing the WASD scrolling on the hotkeys. It's something so stupid, but... I talk about that uh, for, for the people who don't know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you explain it. Oh, uh, you want me to talk about it? Okay, yeah. So, yeah. Um, to, when I first started, I come from uh, you know games that you use the arrow keys to, to move the camera. 
Call of um, Duty, you just talked about yeah, it, for yeah, example. Like, exactly. Like a- any game that requires you to move the camera, it's with the arrow keys. And that was normal for me. I played a lot of Flash games that required that as well. So that was like completely normal for me to use the arrow keys. So I was using that when I was playing single player. I'd use the actual arrow keys to move the camera when I'm playing uh, campaigns when I was like really, really low level. But then when I came to online, I said, you know what? Instead of using the arrow keys, I'll make it WASD so I can access other hotkeys. And I thought that was a good thing. Mm-hmm. But another reason why I had to use it is that I actually, when I first started playing, I had I was 13, I had no money. I, I used whatever I had. I had a monitor that was 1280 by 760 resolution. So I didn't see, basically, if I if my main goal is on my screen, I can see like maybe just my talent center and that's it. Nothing else. Like you Wait barely see anything. Wait a second. At the beginning yeah. of Vubli, that was before the user patch, that was the standard resolution. I, I think, or, yeah, right. In Vubli as well. Only when the user patch came out, that's when uh, the wide patch, I think it was called the wide screen resolution, wide, wide screen patch or something, though, or was it called? It allowed you to actually match your game resolution to your desktop resolution. But before that, that was the kind of resolution everybody mm-hmm. was playing with. So you were still playing with that kind of resolution when the user patch came out? Yeah, I think the user patch came out before I started playing because when I started playing, I think I was playing on something that's, at least in my knowledge, that people were playing on a much higher resolution because when I talked to other people, they were like, Crazy. how are you playing on that? Um, right. So yeah, I had, I had basically no space to see anything. And right. so if I had to scroll with my mouse, I would be constantly scrolling with my mouse. My mouse, I can't click anything. So I had to use the WASD to move my camera around, which is very interesting because it's actually a bad set of hockeys to have, but back then it was very much needed. So um yeah basically spent a few years of my life playing like that and amazing <laughs> i needed the, yeah i needed the wasd to help me out there so that's kind of the origin story of it but then in 2019 when d first came out i threw it all in the garbage because yeah it's just not a good hockey system for multiple reasons um you need your you know those hockeys are super important you need them for other things you can't be wasting keyboard clicks to move the camera it's not important um and you can bounce around your screen using control groups which i later used as well uh, or used a lot more as well. So it's, right. it was a big change that, that helped me out. Right. So that's a pretty basic change, I'll say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wonder, um, which probably allowed you to hit higher level, but I wonder if there was a more, uh, let's say, deep change, something ah. in the way you see the game, in the way you think about strategy, or was there a specific change? Or would you say it was just all the results, you know, the accumulation of experience, you're playing more and more in high level games? Um, I think similar uh, around the s- similar time, actually, around NEC3, uh, I was practicing a lot for the tournament. It was the first time I was really, really practicing for. And the one change in mentality was that when I get ahead in a game, when I get a lead, that I don't try to kill my opponent and don't try to end the game and just instead look to extend my lead, gain more confidence in that late game. And I think that that's something that I really learned uh, to to master in that in that tournament, or at least not to master, but at least to, you know, uh, to use in my games. And I would say that another thing along the same lines, when I, when you get an advantage, you can just play defensively because your opponent has to attack you or else they just continue to fall behind. So mm-hmm. it was just a little bit more strategical thinking that kind of clicked for me around NEC3 uh, right. that allowed me to be a lot less predictable and a lot more well-rounded as a player, which helped me a lot. That's so interesting, actually. It's something that I, as a player, struggle with all the time. If I have army, I want to use it, and then I throw it away. It's something yeah. that happens time and time again. <laughs> Uh, all right, so the fact you suddenly became more active as a streamer in 2019, as we just talked about, mm-hmm. was it because you actually really liked to stream or was it just a way for you to motivate yourself, you know, to keep up the grind and keep improving as a player? Uh, I actually have a pretty good story associated to that, so I think it's a good time for it now. Please, uh, please. I started streaming for fun in 2016 or 2017, but just like literally a couple streams and I quit for like half a year or a year. No, nothing serious at all but i just enjoyed having people watch me play because right. i felt like i was playing at a good level and to have people watch and you know that they enjoy that would make me feel good making me feel like it's more than just playing and i always liked interacting with people as well that was like the main motive for streaming initially but then mm-hmm. fast forwarding to like 2019 around hidden cup one i was actually streaming part-time at the time i was working streaming for fun and also um uh, going to college so i had like three things going on for me and around Hidden Cup 1, uh, I was watching at, on my break during my work. And at my work, I was making like $800 a month. Stream only brought me like $200 a month. So it was way lower on the money side. Mm-hmm. But I always did it because I enjoyed it. So around Hidden Cup 1, I was watching uh, the games on my uh, on my phone, on my break from work at a nearby restaurant. And then I said, uh, as I was watching it, I was just really into it. I was really enjoying it. I was like, wow, yeah. I, I really want to do this. 
And so on that break, I never went back to my store. I never called in them. I'm, I'm wow, done. Amazing. I quit my job on the spot and I said, I'm going to stream and I'm going to really double down because I want to play in these tournaments. And back then That's it was like, story. yeah, it's like, it, it wasn't exactly about uh, whether I liked it or the money. It was a little bit of everything. It was like, I, I want to do this. I want to invest more time and I want to try and do it. And the money wasn't so bad. Like I was making $200 a month, which is not mm-hmm. like the 800 for my job, but it's Right. Not bad. And I felt like I can grow it a lot more. Okay. So this was again 2016, you just said? Mm-hmm. So no, 2016. No, sorry, no, that was 2019. Sorry about that. 2019. Yeah. So a little mm-hmm. bit later. That, that's what I thought. Um, so can you name one thing you really love about streaming and one thing you really hate about streaming? <laughs> uh, oof, damn. Uh, <laughs> I guess you kind of said the one thing you love. So you can, can just go ahead and say the one you hate. Yeah. Well, the one I love, uh, like I said, is interaction. I think that's the main thing. Um, Love to talk like to the, to the viewers and chatters. One thing I dislike, uh, I think if there's one thing I dislike, it's the people who come on just to provoke or just to be negative and toxic for no reason. It's not constructive feedback. It's not like an instant comment. They're provoking. They're being toxic. They're sometimes even lying about what someone else said. They bring drama from other sources, bring it to your chat. And I think if, if there's one thing I really, really hate about streaming, it's it's that useless negativity you know what i mean that comes in from nowhere and that kind of um you know encompasses your whole chat for a moment and i think it's really stressful as a streamer to deal with that because there's some negativity that comes from me as a streamer as well like when i lose a game and i'm like pissed there's some natural negativity that comes out of there but that that has like a source and and it's something that i can control so as a streamer i can reflect on that be like dude i messed up i shouldn't have done that but when it comes from an outside source for no apparent reason it's just like why you know so that, that's like for me the most frustrating. And they, they know no limits. Like there's people that come in and say all kinds of things. Because it's so easy, right? You're totally anonymous. You don't yeah. know who they are. It's so easy to do it, right? How how do you deal with it? You just learn to ignore it? Mm, I think I don't have the full answer. If I did, it would be a lot easier sometimes to handle those things. But I think it really depends on the situation. I would say that if it's just um uh, pure negativity pure toxicity the best thing to do is ignore it and then just ban the person don't say anything about it but i think if it's more like uh you know negativity that started people jumping on it a lot of like drama in the chat the best thing to do i think is just address it one shot tell everyone to stop and then just say if anyone continues i'm gonna you know remove you from the chat um and i think that what helps me is having a really good mod team that will Mm -hmm. You know, and these are just volunteers, the mods, they're just, you yeah. know, regulars on my stream that want to help me out and they help filter that out when I'm focusing in the game. Because I do believe that having a good chat environment is really important for streaming. I, I don't, no one likes to be working in a negative environment. When one of those situations occur, uh, do you keep thinking about it or do we really manage to just flip a switch and just move on with your stream and forget about it totally? I think, I think other streamers can forget about it. For me me personally, it really affects me. So it's something that I actually hang on and sometimes it could ruin my entire stream because of the moment. It just depends on how it's, uh, how it went down and what's said. How bad it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me personally, I don't care what people have to say about me. Like I actually don't mind that at all, but I think it's Mm -hmm. when people start trash talking other people in the chat, when people start trash talking other top players, that's when I really Mm -hmm. take it, you know, to heart because I don't want to be, I don't want my stream to be like a, um, a platform for people to trash talk others and like openly do it. And so I think the, the the stuff that really bothers me is when people come to my chat and be like, yo, this MBL guy or this Leary guy or this Viper guy, they're washed. They, they suck. They, they mm-hmm. only know how to do one thing. And when you, when you see stuff like that, that's like my, my absolute no go. And that's what, what really, really, really bothers me. Right, right, right. Um, so yeah, you just said you quit your job. I think this was back in January, 2019. Mm-hmm. Uh, what job was that? I used to work at a deli in a grocery store. So I'd be cutting uh, cold cuts, cheeses. I'd be serving, you know, olives, whatnot, that, that kind of stuff. At the time, was that something you could see yourself doing for a couple nah. more years? Okay. Nah. So you knew... You Part-time, knew... just for money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no, passion, work... no passion in the industry whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> did you work other jobs before that one? Yeah, I worked two jobs like that. So that one and one before that was similar. And then I also worked at a uh, pharmacy just as like a clerk, basically a shelf stalker boy and like, a, yeah, just like a random. Was that a little bit there. better or not really? Uh, it was better for some ways, but it was also more boring. Like the the deli job is like more dirty because like you're working with like food. There's like, you know, a lot of like mess around you always, but it's more fun. You're just like slicing with the machine, which is satisfying. <laughs> uh, and like some of the, some aspects of the job are like fun to do. 
So it was like harder and more dirty work, but it was more fun. The other job was like more boring. Right. Uh, so you just said you went to college to, to become a math teacher, if I remember correctly, right? It, it, not at first, but it, it turned into that, yeah. It, okay, <laughs> so talk about it. What, what was it at first? Well, like at first it was to become, uh, I want to go into like science, study sciences and become like an engineer because that's all I knew. Like, my dad was an engineer. My two okay. brothers ahead of me were, were engineers, like really smart and really successful in their studies. Uh, my mom was also super successful. She did medicine early and then some other... Wow got like two other masters so education for my family was just like the standards were so high so, so i you wanted to follow in the footsteps yeah and like exactly and i at first didn't hit that because my high school marks weren't good in my last year uh because okay. i started playing league and really dove into that uh <laughs> so gaming has always hindered my studies and so i um didn't get a smooth road into the sciences and the science right. programs but i did try programming hated it did try <laughs> physics chemistry high math Liked some aspects, didn't like others, but in the end, I just couldn't sustain it because I was a really, uh, really poor student, basically. Okay, <laughs> so then you turned into becoming a math teacher. Yeah. So Nelly was a math teacher. Spirit of the Law was a math teacher. You wanted to be a math teacher. I'm beginning to sense a pattern here. <laughs> You're right. So you didn't finish your degree, though. You quit college no. in 2021. So did you quit because you wanted to focus on streaming full time, or was it also because you just weren't enjoying college? Uh, so it's not college that I quit in, in Quebec. It's very uh, specific. It's They call it CJEP, which is just two years after high school. Um, mine finished in right. three years because of the complications. But I actually finished that step and I moved on to university. And then I did oh, one year okay, of university. Yeah, I did one year of university. At first, it was to become a math teacher. Then it was marketing because it was something I enjoyed as well. And mm -hmm. then I quit at that point. So it's hard to explain because CJEP is something that's foreign to a lot of other um, most no, but I get countries. it. Just, just uh, after high school, before you go you go to college, you have these two years yeah. to kind of figure out what you what you want to do. Probably right. Yes. Yeah, so I finished that part of the studies, and I was in university. Did one year of uni, and then I quit after that. Right. So yeah. why did you quit? Because you just didn't enjoy college, or was it because you just enjoyed streaming more? Mm, I think it's because I had a lot more opportunities in streaming, and I wanted to pursue that a lot more. That was the main mm -hmm. reason. I never right. really enjoyed school, so I can't say that like I was hanging on to anything special. For me, school was just something I did because there's nothing else to do. And it was just right, like right. The, the easy option, basically. Right. Okay, Hera, you became a very good player at a very young age, and that means you became well-known in the community and were sort of in the public eye when you were still very young. You know, and the fact you were very young, combined with your very competitive nature, means you sometimes said things and done things people described as very toxic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everybody can relate to that. I mean, everybody has said things in the heat of the moment they later regret, especially on the Internet. But here's something you wrote on AOE Zone in February 2021. And I quote, to the people bringing up some of the terrible things I've said in the past, Yes, that was very terrible. And I've made so many changes in my personal life that I'm just not the same person anymore. I can tell you that just three, uh, two to three years ago, I was yelling and in worst cases, swearing at my parents of all people because I was generally an arrogant piece of you know what. Today, I can proudly say that I haven't raised my voice at them in well over a year. I thank God for how far I've come in just a few years because I was truly on a destructive path before. First of all, Massive respect for having the guts to share such a personal struggle of yours in a public forum. But the reason the reason I'm bringing this up is because it seems like the sort of behavior you were sometimes displaying online was also affecting you in real life. So I wonder what led you to the realization you really wanted to change. Was there one specific situation or incident in the past that really made you think, okay, this is it. I, I have to stop acting this way. Um, God, this is the, probably the heaviest topic so far. Uh, I I think it's something I always struggle with was uh, not controlling what you say, especially in the heat of the moment. So, and that was that wasn't just an online thing. Like uh, people, we talked about the non anonymity of Twitch chat before. Uh, that wasn't the case for me. I didn't say things online because it's anonymous. I said the same things IRL. Um, but it's not like I'm a, a negative person always. It's just when I get angry, and that's like the big, uh, the big thing. So. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's something that I struggled a lot. What was the change? Like, what was the turning point? I think the turning point was just seeing how bad these things are, both on a personal scale and for like my reputation as a player and just seeing just how poorly it's being taken. Like at first I didn't think it was a big deal. It's like, dude, I was angry, like relax, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But then I realized like, as I got older, I was like, no, like what you say, even if you're angry, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, if you say it, 
it's you're responsible for it and you you're not allowed to just go around and say whatever saying whatever you want um and justifying it to yourself so i think it's something that as i grew older i recognized how um how big of a deal it was and how just how bad it was and so i think that was the biggest realization at a certain point i was just like dude it's it's not healthy it's not good and i have to you know make some changes as well in my life you know i myself i'm someone with a fairly mellow personality i'll say i hate confrontation and i try to avoid it as much as i can be it verbal or physical confrontation i just try to avoid it as much as i can so it's i understand what you're saying but it's hard for me to kind of realize how it is or to understand how mm -hmm. it is uh was it hard for you to make this change is it something that you really had to fight and you know really work on yourself or do you think that with maturity and with age it sort of happened naturally no it was really difficult for sure because um although you naturally become a lot more like you know um i guess tempered maybe that's the right word as you get, get older but it, it wasn't like i just completely switched off as i got older i still have moments even to this day where i'm like getting overly frustrated, overly angry and saying the wrong things over something so silly. And I even to this day, I have to remind myself it's not worth it. You know, I reflect on some of the things I say and it's not as bad as it was, nowhere near as bad as it was back then. But, you know, it's 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 a constant battle to kind of like keep your emotions in check. Watch out what you say, watch out what you do. Um, so I would say that it's not easy and it's something that I definitely struggled with back then and struggle with even to this day as well. Uh, I think the thing that you have to, uh, that for me, and I can talk to myself now that I have mm -hmm. to keep in, mm -hmm. keep in check the most is always like, if I feel like a rush of emotions and the rush to say something, the best thing to do is to take a deep breath and then tackle that same issue in 10 minutes, like that same okay. issue. I'll look back at it in 10 minutes, think about it and analyze the situation. Like what went wrong? Why was I angry? That kind of stuff. But right away, analyzing any situation or talking to someone or whatnot in that heat of the moment is just not something I can actually do properly. So that's for me the best thing, just a little time uh, when I'm feeling like angry, stressed or frustrated, take a deep breath, wait a few minutes and then tackle that same topic later. It's a lot easier to, to handle things and to have, handle stressful moments, both in game and IRL uh, with that kind of method. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as I can tell, you've gotten much better at it. I mean, we've both kind of had a testy exchange, me and you, just a few weeks ago. And I think the way we resolved it was very mature and very mm -hmm. natural. So as far as I can tell, we've definitely made made steps there. All right, Hera, um, in the late 2021, after Red Bull Wolalo 5, two bombshell news hit the Age of Empires community. T90 and Viper, the two biggest streamers in our community, leave Twitch and sign an exclusive contract with Facebook. Later on, we learned that you were also offered a deal to move to Facebook, but you declined. Now, I know roughly the values involved in both T90s and Viper's contract, but I know little about the deal Facebook offered you. Now, mm -hmm. I don't expect you to reveal any numbers here, though feel free to if you want. But the funny thing is, that was actually the second time you declined an offer from Facebook. A few years prior, they made you a first offer, and you yourself actually revealed the numbers involved in that first offer. If memory serves, I believe Facebook offered you $17,000 a month to stream on their platform. Yeah, you was, declined that offer? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. 18,000, but yeah, just 18, very similar. Right. Yeah. You declined that offer, but you did say that kind of money was way above what you were making on Twitch at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, having refused that first offer, I think it's pretty safe to assume the more recent second one, second offer had even bigger numbers attached to it, and yet you still declined it, despite knowing both T90 and Viper had accepted theirs. So if money was not the issue, what made you refuse the offer or the offers? Mm. Well, if you think about what I enjoy with streaming, it's the chat interactivity. It's the, you know, having the viewers there, being able to talk to people. And that's just not something I would have had on, on Facebook. And so no matter how big the money is, I just don't see, um, I just don't see it being enough of a motivator to, to switch because I, I value other things a lot more than money. I will say I'm in a pretty like blessed situation because I can earn a good enough income on Twitch thanks to my subscribers, thanks to the people who support me there. And I think that because I'm in such a position where I'm able to choose between more money or more enjoyment with my job, you know, I, I do have a lot of, um, you know, I do have a, what's the word, I guess, a very, um, po very good position. I, they're missing a word, um, very lucky position to be in, I, I guess I can say. Um, so I get to choose I and mean, make that decision. And I personally valued, um, you know, enjoying the job, enjoying the day to day, 
that I'm doing. And that was ultimately the, the better choice for me personally. So was it clear to you that you were not going to get those things on Facebook? Because as far as I understand both, I, I don't know if T90 and Viper themselves were hoping to grow bigger channels, but I'm pretty sure that would, they were kind of thinking that those things you're talking about were still going to be present on Facebook. Um, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they don't get anywhere near the numbers they had on Twitch. Right, but, right, for but sure. Because, but there's still some of it. Yeah, exactly. Because they were so much bigger than me, they maybe retained some of it. But for right. me, I, like, I was pretty big on Twitch, but like, I don't have that YouTube following. I don't have like that overall following that I can say, yo, I'm coming to Facebook, please come watch. I feel like right. a lot of people would just kind of forget and not come. And it wasn't an easy decision, especially the first offer right. was a bit easier because uh, at the time I was you know, still growing on Twitch. The second offer was a lot harder, A, because the sum of money was absolutely ridiculous. It's just, it's money mm -hmm. I would never even dream to make, let alone to refuse. So <laughs> that it's just, it's just not something that you ever can plan for at, in my opinion, at a young age. Um, so it, it wasn't an easy decision. I went back and forth on it. But in the mm -hmm. end, I just, uh, yeah, I, I'm just not a materialistic person. I don't, I don't really see the value in that sum of money. It doesn't make me any happier. It doesn't bring anything to my life that's different. So like I said, because I was in a fortunate position, I still earn a good living. I still make a good amount of money doing what I do. I, I love the day-to-day -day here. And I just felt happy. like, yeah, I, I, have a good, I have enough money. And I think, you know what? I think sometimes not having an excess amount of money is a good motivator. Like when I go into a tournament, I have to win because if I don't win, then I didn't earn enough and I, I'm actually, you know, I might struggle to pay some bills and I, I might struggle to, you know, to make not ends meet in terms of like put food on the table, but, you know, I might struggle to afford some of the things I want to afford. So it kind of put, gives you that motivation, gives you that extra kick behind every tournament. And I think that sometimes if you earn a random big sum of money, that, that motivation could be lost and I don't want to lose that motivation. Man, I'm... I have to say, I find it extremely impressive how such a young guy like you has the maturity and, you know, and sort of the long-term vision to refuse such an enormous amount of money. So no regrets so far? Uh, there were some moments that I regretted it because I just felt like um, I, I tried to use the time that, you know, I had on Twitch to grow the channel and like with AB4 coming out, uh, I, I tried to do things to kind of like, you know, push me forward as a streamer, try different things out because I had, you know, the platform still. But uh, nothing really stuck. Like, AB4 was fun at first. I had a really good viewership at first, but the game slowly started dying down. I stopped enjoying the game. And mm -hmm. so I just told myself, like, at a certain point, I'm just going to go back to what I enjoy and not kind of try to grow my channel uh, with, like, the surge of new viewers coming in. I also tried to do League at, the, at that point as well, just because right. it was the perfect time to try something new because AB4 is dying down. AB2 is in a pretty, like, stale state. So mm -hmm. I said, this is as good a time as any. I didn't care to put the big tournaments like NEC, uh, N4C, and Golden League were coming up. I didn't care for either of them, even though the price pool were massive. For me, mm -hmm. I, once again, the price pool was not the main motivator. So mm -hmm. I tried to do League, and I you know, tried to uh, push myself to get a high ELO there. I wasn't really planning to go like full-time League or anything. I just wanted to see how the vibe was, because I always wanted to stream League. That was one of my goals initially, because um, uh, I did play a lot of it back then. But yeah. after playing a month or two of League, I, again, it got boring to me because I played so much of it in such a short amount of time. The negativity just didn't, it didn't feel fun at some point because there's a lot more negativity and toxicity there. So again, the things that I loved about AB2 just weren't present in League. They weren't present in AB4 either. Right. And so all roads led back to AB2. And for me, I would never plan to quit AB2 even when AB4 was there. I always told my followers, listen, I, I'm doing this temporarily because there's StarCraft players here. It's a new game. It's really exciting for me. And once I got that S tier win, I always knew I was going to come back to AB2. I just wanted to like, tr you know, prove myself there. And so AB2 was never going to leave my life uh, at any point. And I was always going to come back. But uh, the way I came back was trying out other things and then realizing the things I have in AB2 are just way too good. And I think that because of those experiences, I'm not able to say that I don't have any regrets, nor with the Facebook, mm -hmm. nor with any other game, because what I have with AB2 is really, really special. I enjoy the game. I can play it daily. I can play it for years and I have a really wonderful community behind me on Twitch and YouTube that can support me and right, they are definitely. supporting me. 
That, that's that's amazing, man. I just want to give a little bit a little bit of context to the people who don't know your full story here. So in late 2021, Microsoft releases Age of Empires 4. And just as you had announced beforehand, you went all in in Age of Empires 4. You grinded the game day after day. You made it to the top of the ladder very fast. And in January of this year, you won an S tier tournament in Age of Empires 4. But it didn't stick to Age of Empires 4 for long, as you just said. And in February, you announced you're leaving Age of Empires 4 to focus on League of Legends. I mean, you made a video explaining your reasons for this switch, so I'll link it down below. You just kind of explained it yourself. And then, indeed, I think it was in late April uh, 2022, um, you seemed to be fully back to Age of Empires 2. And again, you just kind of explained your reasons there. Do you still follow Age of Empires 4 from time to time? Um, I actually love the players in AB4. Like the, the community there is actually really good. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I would say I follow them not because of the game, because of the players. Like I love Marine Lord. The Muslim, the Canadian bros, like there's so many people, Beastie, so many people in there that I play, I competed against, I played with, cool guys, great personalities. And so I follow for those people. I want to see Marino doing well in every tournament. I like to see the Muslim and Beastie bringing their best. I like to see the different names that I played against up there and, and being successful. Uh, even Mista and Magic, for example, the Age of Mythology guys. I really love all of those people and I follow for them and not for the game. But to some extent, I still follow uh, a little bit of what goes on there, like I said, for mm -hmm. the players. Amazing. Do you have an opinion on the current state of the game? You no, know, I keep hearing very good things about it, and the community <laughs> seems to be yeah. pretty happy with it. Yeah, I keep hearing good things as well. Um, and it's not out of the question that I might pick up AB4 and play like for mm -hmm. another tournament if I feel that it's like, you know, that, you know, that I want to do that. But if I just like if I even just stop to think about a commitment like that, dude, I'm loving AB2 right now. The tournaments mm -hmm. are great. The day-to-day -day streaming has been great. The ladder is pretty active. These are the kind right. of things I love. And if you think to like, why did I leave AV2 initially or temporarily leave AV2 to try AV4? It's because the ladder was pretty dead. There wasn't a lot of tournaments happening or there was some tournaments, but I was a bit burnt out. So like it wasn't as interesting for me. And so the reasons why I went to AV4 and League are just no longer here anymore. This AV2 is in a great spot. And I don't see myself leaving, be it for AV4, even temporarily, or even just trying to do both at once. I just don't have have it in me I don't, I don't feel the need i have everything i want in av2 you know it's all good amazing amazing it's, it's so good to hear uh so you just said you're happy with the state of age of empires 2 today uh, what do you think still needs to be improved uh dude I, I just wish that people would listen when i say these things that the, the game is so so well balanced right now it, everything is just feels so fun so fresh yeah there's some balance adjustments that need to be made it's never going to be perfect some steps have to be like you know nerfed buffed etc can However, you specify a little bit? Yeah, I think like some steps like Poles, just still way too strong. Burgundian, still way too strong. Mayans, Chinese, Aztecs have always been still a little too strong. So like these top steps, either a small nerf there and then a buff to like the weaker steps, the boring ones like Teuton, Slavs, Persians, etc. Uh, just to make you know the balance a bit more even. But other than that, other than a small few changes to the balance, the game's in a great spot. What the game needs, if you ask me, a complete mm -hmm. revamp of the entire lobby system. Just start over from scratch. The lobby system is absolutely horrendous. Sometimes you search for a game and it's not there. You want to play with your friends, you have to invite them. After a game, the rematch system is completely janky. You have to reinvite. These mm -hmm. things, the team game ladder, terrible. These things are really, <laughs> really bad. And I don't say that to bring any bring AW down. It, it's actually against my interest for AW two to be talked down to go down. No, yeah, you just you just started by saying it's in an amazing spot. So yeah, these exactly. are just things you need to improve. Yeah, uh, do you have specific but... suggestions though for the lobby system and for the uh, team game ladder? Yeah, I have a few ideas. So I think that the team game ladder is like the, the rank queue for the team game I think is kind of hopeless at this point. I think what they should do is bring back ranked lobbies for team games, keep the 1v1 queue, completely take away the quick match queue, just completely abolish it completely take away a game with like Battle Royale that they didn't invest any moments of their time into. Like no one knows Battle Royale. <laughs> they launched it and then dropped I it like a baby. Like, really forgotten it exists. <laughs> exactly. Like I, I don't understand why they're wasting their time like launching something and then dropping it. It doesn't make sense. So I think that, um, you know, take away the quick match, take away Battle Royale or whatever they call it. Um, and then bring in ranked lobbies, make the lobby system uh, appealing make it easy to access, and also bring back a community vibe. When you log in, your friends should right away be listed. Who's doing what? Who's playing? There should be a message system in-game. Forget about the message system of Steam. Message system in-game. Yo, what's up? You want to play? That kind of stuff. Create a community aspect, community 
uh, building aspect. Like after you play a game with someone, you can message them, that kind of stuff. So like you want people to connect, you want people to play together. And I think if you focus more on the queue system and how it is right now, there's almost no way to make new friends, almost, almost no way to connect if you're not using Discord or Steam. So I think bring community aspects in game, make the lobby system accessible, easy to use, and also make it for everything that's not ranked 1v1. So you make a queue for ranked 1v1, because that's actually popular and successful. Everything mm -hmm. else is ranked lobbies. There's some downsides. People can abuse the ranked lobby, queue up, lose games, ban those people. Make, make the system so good to where you see the match history. If someone is point trading, just ban them. That's it. And everyone else, the 95% of people will have a better experience. And I think that's what needs to change. It sounds a whole lot... It sounds like you're describing Vubli. So would you say, just let's just go back to how Vubli was, at least for the team game ladder? Well, I think that Vubli had so many things against it. Like, no, first of all, it's hard to know about Vubli because it's just right, like, so right. random. I'm talking about the system, though, the system that Vubli had. Yeah, but I'm getting there. Like, Vubli had so much against it, and despite all the things against it, it still managed to survive so long because, like I said, the system was so, so good. Right. So I think the system that Vubli had should or something similar, just modernized, should be implemented here because it's been proven to work. Like I said, everything is against Wubli. It had like nowhere, no reason to survive, and yet it did because of how good the game was, or the game mm -hmm. is, and how good the system was and Wubli. I think it was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, uh, Hera, in September this year, you left your home country of Canada, and you're now living in Argentina. Is this the first time you've been away from your family for an extended period of time? Uh, yes, actually. this uh, I never traveled away from them except for land events so this is the first time since you told me you're very close to your family so was it hard to move away at first um it was exciting because i had like uh you know it was it was a brand new experience that kind of stuff so it was exciting in a way but definitely miss my family and definitely um mm -hmm. you know something that i obviously miss of being in canada i think it's probably the only thing i miss in canada is the family Maybe a couple okay. other small things like a local bubble tea shop. But <laughs> other than that, I don't really miss much about Canada except uh, the family part now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You enjoying the country so far? Yeah, Ar Argentina is absolutely beautiful. Like, uh, I think that it's something that I didn't even plan to stay this long at first, but I, right. I decided to stay longer because of how much I enjoyed here. I mm -hmm. think it's something that if, if people don't know much about Argentina, don't know much about you know what's going on here, highly recommend if you have if you have like the time and the resources to come down here for like a couple weeks just sightsee there's so many beautiful things to see uh the people are so friendly and so warm and mm -hmm. i don't even speak fully the language but i can just tell mm -hmm. just right. i met some i met some fans here both planned like both with meetup and both and also accidentally like people just call me on the street and stop me um wow. even the, yeah that has happened yeah the first day i was here um I got stopped by a fan and he said, dude, are you uh, like, are you Canadian? I said, yes. And he's like, are you Hera from Age of Empires? I said, yes. Wow, I was like, I amazing. can't believe. Where? Yeah, I can't, Where I can't was it? Happened. Where was it? It was just in a random area in downtown. It was uh, at a hotel, like in a amazing. hotel lobby. Amazing. Was the, it the first time that happened to you? Yes, it never happened in Canada. Well, I didn't leave my basement in Canada much, so <laughs> that, it's also part of it. But it, it still was new. Cause, and, and you might ask why. There's a massive community in, in, uh, right. of Age of right. Empires in Argentina. South America in general as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, Argentina is beautiful. The people are, are really warm. And the AB, uh, AB2 culture is like really massive here. So uh, I, I absolutely love it here. And I'm actually grateful that I'm able to spend more time here. Amazing, amazing. Do you have any plans for how long you want to stay there? Or was it just very much an open question at this point? Uh, I think I want to do a few more months to a year from now. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a good amount of time. But I'm not planning too far into the future because uh, I had future plans a couple of years ago and everything changed. Like, right. I, I'm coming to realize, at least from my lifestyle right now, that things aren't set. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Right. No one's right, even right, guaranteed right. to have tomorrow. So there's no point of even worrying about future plans at this point. So I, I'm hoping for like another year or so. I think that's a good timeline, but who knows? It could be more, it could be less. It really just depends on what happens. Um, yeah, I think if there's one downside about Argentina is the really, really long travels to Europe. It's brutal mm. to be on a plane for 14 hours, especially if you hate flying like myself. 
So that's like the only big downside <laughs> about it for me. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. And that's one of the great things about streaming, though. You can basically do a job from almost mm-hmm. anywhere in the world, right? I believe it's summer there right now. So it must be yes. confusing for you because I believe December in Montreal is pretty brutally cold, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my family right now is like snowed in. There's like a, a snowstorms that came in. And so, yeah, it's, it's a completely different lifestyle. <laughs> Amazing. All right, Hera, uh, back to AOE2. You had a mm-hmm. bit of a rough 2022 at first, but have now finished it indeed very strong. You made it to the semifinals of Red Bull Lolo Legacy, the biggest tournament in the history of the franchise. You made it to the final of Warlords, and just a week ago, you won the Grand Melee in Hanover, Germany, the last STO tournament of the year. So yeah, please talk a little bit about the Grand Melee. How was the whole experience like for you? Yeah, so the Grand Melee was absolutely amazing. I think as a tournament, uh, it was... Uh, a great experience, A, because it was a dream hack, and I've heard a lot about dream hack. They actually did dream hacks in my um, city of birth, or like my where I lived, Montreal. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm not, it's not, it's nothing new to me, and I was actually very excited to be part of one. And it was a, a really cool atmosphere. Like without even talking about the AOE part of it for a second, walking around, and seeing so many different games on display, so many people, mm-hmm. you know, just walking around, enjoying the, the kind of venues that they had. Uh, it was a great experience to be in a dream hack. And as far as like the AOE event goes, it was also really well, um, really well organized from a player perspective. Like right, 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 right. We were in the, the right logistics. Place. Yeah, right. exactly. We were at the right place at the right time. The the people running the event were amazing. They're so accommodating. If you had any issue, like the sun in your eye, they mm-hmm. they solved it really quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had the places to practice. You had all the snacks and all the food that you can ask for. It was just really well done for the players' perspective. And I would say it's probably the land I enjoyed the most uh, being at. It was such a chill environment. They, you come in early, um, you know, everything's there for you. It, it was really a good experience. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so as, as I just said before, you had been getting increasingly better and better results over the year, but hadn't managed to win an STO tournament yet. So did you change anything in your preparation for this tournament or did you just trust your process and stuck to it? Well, I did win STO in Hidden Cup 4. No, no, I mean in 20, uh, 2022. Oh, 2022, yeah, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> Sorry, right, right, right. Sorry yeah. I should have specified uh, 2022. No, no, that, that's totally okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it's not that I changed anything uh, in my gameplay. It's just my confidence rose. Uh, right. I think what happened was after Warlords, I was really shaky in the semis and finals. I was just low confidence for whatever reason. But then the people around me kept telling me, yo, like, you, I know you're low confidence, but mm-hmm. you really shouldn't be. You have great results. You're really consistent. You're at the top of your game. I think what really helped me is that after Warlords, I played a show match for Spiper, and I was just like, you know what, I'm going to play my game. And, and you beat him, was, right? Yeah, I, I won 4 1, and the game I lost was Ring of Reeds, which is the map I never really figured out. <laughs> but yeah, the, the idea is like, you know, I was just playing good Age of Empires, and I was calm and I was doing well. And so going into the Grand Melee, I wanted to bring something like that uh, to the table. And my confidence just rose from that show match. And I, I think that as the tournament went on, my confidence rose even more. Mm-hmm. There was one thing that was worth mentioning that for a LAN event, it was, uh, it's always really hard for me because of like the in-ear situation, the noise canceling. I, I actually hate not playing with my equipment. So it was, that was a, an obstacle to overcome, but I actually managed to overcome it. And I was very, very, really happy about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a bit of a problem for everybody, right? And I guess that's one of the negative things uh, ab- about a LAN tournament, right? Okay, so <laughs> what do you make of that somewhat awkward moment when you were kidnapped on stage mid-interview? <laughs> yeah, it's actually funny because uh, I-, I thought that it was kind of fun. Like when I was getting kidnapped, uh, I thought like, oh, that, that was cool. Like it was, it was funny. You didn't then... know it was going to happen, right? It was a surprise for you. No, no, I didn't know. Um, oh, you I did acted, know? I acted surprised on purpose but i was also surprised by the lights going out so it was like a mixture of like acting and also a mixture of like wait this is not this is different you know i didn't expect it to go that did you know it was going to be mid interview so they tell me mid interview but they did at the start of the interview like i answered two questions and then they took me and that was like really bad so i think (laughs) at first i thought it landed well but then i I, viper talked to me he's like yo i think they should have let you get a lot more time i was like oh really and then i watched it back and it was I think it did not land on Twitch whatsoever. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It was, I think, something that wasn't needed. The tournament itself was hype enough. You don't need mm-hmm. to go over the top and do gimmicky things. So I think that that's something that, you know, props to them for trying never again kind of thing, which is fair <laughs> enough. You know, that's how it goes sometimes, you know? Like, um, so I think that it's, it kind of robbed the, it robbed me and the viewers of a proper winner's interview. Probably a, one of the biggest moments of my career could have, 
could have followed that up better, I think. And people really mm-hmm. wanted to hear some of my thoughts, I think, on the on the games. Yeah. And I really wanted to talk about the games as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, it's one thing I hear all the time that people producing these big events, they want to make a big thing about a narrative. So a tournament needs to have a narrative, needs to have a story. I just think that I leaned too much into that for yeah. this tournament, <laughs> you know, with the whole secret order behind it and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hera, so the games are great. The show was great. And from a player's perspective, the event was amazing, as you just said. Uh, though there was still a fair bit of controversy surrounding the organization of the event. Um, first, there's the fact they announced it very late, uh, which meant some top players weren't able to get visas on time. And here I'll actually side with the organizers because as someone who's organized tournaments myself, I know that the thing you want the most is to announce your event as soon as possible. I mean, you're proud of your work. You think your tournament will be great. So you just want to announce it, right? So if they didn't announce it earlier, I just have to assume they really were not in the position to for whatever mm-hmm. reason. The other problem, though, was the closed streaming policy. And here I really have a hard time understanding this decision. So I wonder what do you make of it? Uh Okay, um, heavy questions, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll start by answering actually the second part of it, which is about the streaming policy. It's mm-hmm. funny because I I used to think the streaming was a competition between me and other Age of Empires 2 streamers. We want to have more viewers than other person and more subs than other person. If someone else gets a, gets a sub, that's a sub that could have gone to you. That's mm-hmm. what was my mentality when I first started because I think it's only natural to see as competition. As I grew older and more matured into the scene and to streaming in general, I realized that it's not like that at all. It couldn't be, couldn't be further from the truth. We're all working together to boost AW2. We want right. AW2 to be successful because if AW2 is successful, we're all successful. Right. And so I think that that's something that really hit me when T90 and Viper moved away from Twitch. They were the guys, bring. they're the main two bringing people to Twitch, growing mm-hmm. the scene. When they leave, sure, they're not taking, quote unquote, the viewers that are happening right there, uh, or, or that are watching right there, they might take them when they're going live, for example, but they're the ones that are bringing, bringing in new viewers and more viewers. And so uh, it, it really is a, a team effort and a group effort. And so mm-hmm. when you think of closed streaming versus open streaming, in the past, I would have told you closed streaming is really good to maximize your profits and to right. make your tournament successful. That I don't think that's true at all. I think that, mm-hmm. I think that open streaming actually gives more viewers to you and yep. to everyone and grows the stream and grows the, the the scene a lot more. And just gets more eyeballs on the whole event, yeah. right? Um, you know, so my sources and my spies tell me they believe the organizers were disappointed with the viewership numbers for their tournament. I believe they hit a peak of around 10K or maybe 15K viewers for the live stream, which, you know, is pretty low for an S-tier Age of Empires 2 tournament these days, which in an, in and of itself is an amazing statement to say, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, now, I understand the disappointment, but I was a- absolutely not surprised by the numbers. I mean, when you don't have two of the biggest content creators like Memb and T90 at the event, and you don't allow them to stream from home, it's pretty obvious to me that a large portion of their audience will just never hear about the tournament. You know, then add to that the fact the channel of the event was streamed on was very new with barely any followers, the lack of promotion. Now, um, I assume you interacted with the organizers, though, so I wonder mm-hmm. if you got the impression this was the last time we saw a LAN tournament from them, or do you think they will remain involved in the game for now? Uh, I-, I spoke with them quite a bit, actually, and we talked about all this if there's any good news, I can say that the organizers were extremely receptive with uh, feedback and right. with um, you know seeing what went wrong and hoping to improve on it in the future. Whether it's going to be the whether we're going to see more DreamHack or more land events from these people, I I, I don't know. I'm not in a position to like right. uh, to talk about it, and I don't I don't actually have that much information. Okay, <laughs> to say whether yes or no. Um, but what I will say is that I feel like whether it's LAN events, DreamHack or something else, I think they're going to continue to organize at least some kind of events or tournaments just right. because I think that you don't set up a new channel, you don't set up a LAN event, and you don't set up these kind of things without having future projections. And I think if they, if someone wants to do all that new stuff to try one tournament and then quit, I think that's the biggest fail you can ever have. Mm-hmm. Who cares how bad the first tournament might have went? There's always chances to improve on that. And I think that um based on like this kind of logic from for myself i think they're gonna do more but i don't i don't have any actual information awesome hera about to let you go my friend what can we expect from you in 2023 what's coming from uh you? 2023 i want to focus a lot on what i have been doing in 2022 at least the later parts of it i want to focus a lot more on content creation 
Uh, I've really upped my YouTube. Uh, you know, I have two channels now, one for gameplay and one for like, you know, educational or, uh, you know, talk, you know, topic talking videos. Uh, and I want to double down on that and do more content for both channels. I want to in- include coaching and try to help up and coming generations to improve at the game, get some new top players in the scene. And one thing I really want to do is coach 2,500 plus ELO or 2,400 plus ELO for free because I think that oh. if I can give them some pointers uh, and some tips, they can actually get to that next level. And I think that that level is the hardest to crack on your own. It's just mm-hmm. impossible to f- even realize what you're doing wrong at that high level. So right. I think I want to try to offer coaching to those people for free um, just because uh, taking money from those people when they're trying to earn a little money from the top just doesn't feel right. Um, and I think that they are the people that would benefit the most from the coaching. So if there's one project I have, it's that one. I mm-hmm. will announce it soon. I'm already planning it. Um, and then as, uh, you know, as beyond that, it's just more of the daily grind for me. I want to play more AW2, uh, keep the consistent results in tournaments, keep the streaming, and keep the content creation as well. It's going really well for me, and I want to just double down on that. Hera, man, I thank you so much for your time. This was awesome. Uh, knowing more about you and hearing your thoughts about these things. Thank you so much for your time, man. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And also, I want to say that you were really complimenting me throughout the interview, and I wanted to squeeze in a thank you, man. I appreciate that. Thanks for saying that. But I never found the time to squeeze them in when, while we're talking. So big thank you to all the kind of words you're saying to me, and big thank you for having me on as well. Uh, I really enjoyed this one, actually, and I think that you had some very thought-provoking questions, which is usually in an interview, they only scratch the surface. You kind of went a little deeper, which I really appreciated. So yeah, thank you for your time and thank you for uh, the interview. I really, really enjoyed it.